All right, guys, uh, let me introduce Chef Kelly Whitaker. Is that right? Yeah, you got it right. And um, he's a badass chef. That's the technical term. So we're going to just kind of hear a little bit about what's going on in your, your BA world. Yeah. And uh, take some questions. I got nothing. Let's hear a round of applause, you guys. Come on. Uh, chef, thank you for having me today at Fairview. This is awesome. Um, it took me like a half second to say yes to this. Uh, some of you was surprised. Um, my wife was surprised because I don't do a lot of this kind of thing, but uh, I have a lot of interest in this, uh, having this conversation in groups like this because so much about my world um, has changed over the last like 10 years. Uh, when I started be getting into cooking and food and restaurants and whether or not you have an interest at all in ever being a part of restaurants or hospitality, um, I do believe that everybody should work a hospitality job once like go, I don't care if it's like barista or whatever, or bagel shop or fine dining. There's something to be, uh, there's something to learn from being in hospitality. So if you wanna be a doctor, if you've worked in a restaurant, believe you're gonna be a better doctor. So um, it's something that, uh, that piqued my interest early on. I wanted to actually, when I graduated high school, I just wanted to Snowboard, so I moved to Colorado and went to Keystone and started doing that. I wasn't thinking about being at the resort or being at the hotel or being in the restaurant, I just wanted to ride. And so that's all that sort of got me into it. And through there, I understood that I could really take this profession anywhere in the world and that I like to travel. And so that's kind of what I did. I started you know, leveraging hospitality, cooking these jobs to travel. So I ended up going to Colorado State um, because I felt like if I didn't leave the mountains, I would be like 90 and still be there. And that's what happens when you move to Summit County. Like people just don't leave. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you're like, what happened to my life? I wanted to keep going. So I came down and went to Colorado State for hospitality. And I actually didn't enter into hospitality school. I entered into business school. Uh, and business school is very difficult, um, but I still was cooking on the side and I still, you know, from being in the resort, I loved like taking care of people and I love the service aspect of things. And, you know, like I said, I like the lifestyle, I like to travel. But uh, so I found out that at CSU, I could transfer since I was a little ahead because of business school, I could transfer into hospitality. And then I could also do a semester abroad in Switzerland. So that's what I did. I, I switched to hospitality, and also that would lead to me graduating a semester early. So I took that, that full opportunity to be like, wait, I can graduate early, I can go to Switzerland, and I can do that, that sounds pretty good. <laughs> so like, this is literally how, <laughs> what drove me in my decision making was, can I live on Lake Geneva? And so I went to HIM, which is Hotel Institute Montreux, in Montreux, Switzerland. Um, and that was beautiful. It was a prep. So for, for hospitality school, it was like I had to put a suit on, which as a cook, that wasn't very comfortable and I don't like suits. Um, so I had to wear a suit every day to class, but after class, we would just go and just jump off the bridge in Lake Geneva and hang out. And it was an incredible experience. Uh, at the time I'd met an Italian chef in Fort Collins that was actually working abroad in Italy while I was going to school in Switzerland. And I had like this nice little break. The beautiful part about the school is that you could go, they wanted to teach you what European hospitality was like versus American hospitality. And the distinct difference, I don't know if you guys have traveled to Europe, but a distinct difference in Europe, we in America view a server job as like something you do while you're going to school. It's not a profession. In Europe, being a server is a profession. There are professional servers, there's prof professional chefs, and that's what you train to do. And you'll be a server your whole life, and it's actually a really high-held position in Europe, whereas here it's like, oh, I'm gonna be an actor, so I'll just be a server on the side or whatever. But anyway, he was in Italy, and I got a call, and uh, he said, you know, I got a couple weeks break, do you wanna come down here and meet me in uh, Southern Italy? And I was like, of course. I figured out how to get on a train. 
So I went during this break, I met up with this chef and he introduced me to some people that I would then later uh, go back to work for my first job in Italy. So I spent two times working in Italy. Um, the first was after the school experience. You're, you're gonna get a real sense of my business plan because <laughs> it has a lot to do with what do I enjoy, what am I passionate about. But he's like, hey, there's a small restaurant on the island of Procida which is, if you know Italy at all, it looks like the boot and the sort of toe of the boot. There's three little islands, Capri, Ischia, and Procida. Procida is this little island. He's like, you can go there, meet the chef. I speak no Italian. I don't know how to, like I barely know how to get there. But I go there and I meet Giovanni, of course. His name is Giovanni. <laughs> and I meet Giovanni and I sit and I get, I figure out how to get on a boat, get across the island, I go and I sit with Giovanni and I sit down and we don't know how to talk to each other. I'm just sitting there, just, we're staring at each other. It's super awkward. Um, I didn't know, you know, I didn't know anything at this time, but I spent the next few months, you know, they would show me something in the kitchen and then I would hang out in the water and, you know, it was just, that was my, my few months. And then I moved back to, back to the States, finished out the degree uh, and then continued to move around. I got the opportunity to go back because of that experience, and this is what you'll find in culinary, or I know this is a culinary, are we just supposed to talk about food only? I was like, I don't know. You guys, this is a culinary class, right? Uh, we'll talk about food too. But, um, you know, so the, I go, I come back, but I really wanted to like dive further in this community for a couple of reasons. One, like, I've, I've always been in impact um, in terms of sustainability, how do communities think about food, and there it's just again it's such a more meaningful way when they're like grabbing the ingredients from outside the backyard and cooking those ingredients. We live in Boulder so we're lucky we get to see a farmer's market or we get to understand local produce but like you know 15 years ago whatever the mindset a lot of mindset communities in the US aren't cooking like that. It's a lot of processed foods, it's a lot of, you know, uh, fast food. So I loved working in Italy and cooking in Italy and learning how to cook in Italy because it was so, so much of it had to do about the locality of how they were thinking about food. You know, it, it's the first place that I saw that like, really what was coming in off the boat or coming out of the garden was what your menu was. Here you might write a menu and to say, I think this did, this ingredient would be this good for this dish or whatever. But there it's like, oh, this shrimp came in today or this, we caught this fish. And that's how, what would, that's how you'd write a menu. And I was like, oh, okay, well that's totally different. And that's why things are very simple there. A little olive oil, a little salt, like, you know, that's let the ingredient shine. And so um, I really love that, ex that as my base of cooking. And that ultimately led to my first restaurant here in Boulder, which is Basta. Um, it means enough. And it was really based on this idea of simplicity. Another reason, you know, for this being sort of this first moment in my culinary life as driving a restaurant like this is because, I don't know if you've seen Basta or know Basta, but it's a terrible location. It's like the worst location, I think, in the country when it comes to, um, you know, do you want to be on Pearl Street? No, I'm out in some ridiculous apartment complex on the other side of Boulder. And I thought, you know, in, in Italy, there was these old pizza places that would be, that survived two world wars that just stood the test of time. And that's kind of how I thought about my first business. I was like, this is a terrible location. I need this to uh, withstand like kind of a war that it's going to take to get this restaurant off the ground. We had no resources, we had no money, we had no whatever. And I just started this business just, you know, and that became, but I kind of, even though I had post the story of Italy, now started working in super fine dining, whatever, Los Angeles, Asia, like all over. When I opened my first project, I really just went back to the simple idea of food and just cooking little dishes out of the wood fire oven and a little pizza. And that's sort of how we founded our group. That's the foundation. Um, so, I would just, uh, let's see, where do we go from here? This isn't rehearsed. I know there was some questions that too, but that you sent me. But uh, anyway, uh, we currently, I'll just go into what we do now. Currently we have uh, five restaurants. Um, so one of them is a bakery next to Basta. 
in that a terrible apartment complex, so I made the same mistake again and did it again. Uh, I don't know why, but I love it. It's delicious. Um, but really where I keep most of my culinary and my brain power is at the Wolf's Taylor in Denver. Um, so we, the two restaurants, both the Wolf's Taylor and Bruto, operate off of you know, no menu. You come in, you pay a set price, we cook food, we give you the menu at the end of the meal, and it's a fine dining tasting menu. So we have places that, you know, like I said, are casual like Basta, that just do wood fire pizza. But now I've kind of gone back to some of the bigger ideas around, um, you know, fine dining and high execution and, and those types of things. And it's pretty incredible. And it's probably too much to talk about in terms of what we do in those restaurants, but we have a lot of creative positions in our group, like director of fermentation. So if you think about pickling or preserving things, um, there's uh, ferment, ferments like making koji and miso, and these are probably like foreign terms. Has anybody ever heard of koji or miso? Um, These kids are from Boulder, yeah. Yeah, I know. I know we're uh, we're definitely we've seen a lot more in Boulder than some other communities. But uh, these are these are fermentations. We make things that restaurants would just buy because it's easy to order. Sometimes maybe or you're ordering it from Japan. We create those ourselves. So you might call it scratch cooking. But these are things like not many companies in the United States have a director of fermentation. And we think about food. Um, and food waste, you know, food waste is the ultimate, like, uh, you know, there's enough food in the world to feed everyone. This is like very, very well known, um, but we throw most of it in the trash. Up to 70% in the United States of what we produce goes into the trash and is never eaten or consumed. So people in communities that don't have food, we actually have enough. So we think about utilizing everything in our restaurants. We, we think about no waste is a big idea for our restaurants um, and that really uh, is without getting like again too too in the weeds with this conversation because it's a little complicated but we think about the full cycle of the restaurant its impact on the community its impact on the environment uh, the people the planet the whole thing is kind of where our heads at and this is a lot of nerdy stuff but um, it has led to our accomplishments this year we were awarded seven uh, uh, recognitions from Michelin which this is the first year for Michelin to be in Colorado has anybody heard of Michelin have you guys heard about it a little bit cool okay this is Boulder uh, so Michelin has never been in Colorado before it's been in New York LA Northern California Chicago but this is the first year they've ever come here a lot of people see awards and they think oh do you have a Michelin star well it was impossible to get a Michelin star a year ago so this is the first year they send just like the movies that are like the food movies, whatever. Like they come in, you don't know, they're secret inspectors. Like we had no idea Michelin was even coming to Colorado. Um, we were hoping to get uh, a Michelin star, like one, or you know maybe a green star. This green star idea is something they introduced a few years ago in terms of sustainability. It's really difficult to get, they're really rare. We got two of them, and then we got two Michelin stars, and then we. Basta got recognized for a Bib Gourmand, they call it, which is like a neighborhood restaurant. Um, that Bib Gourmand uh, is shared with only nine wood fire pizza places in the world. So, you know, for it to be in Boulder and that stupid apartment complex <laughs> that I was talking about, uh, to get a Bib Gourmand is like a really, really big deal for, um, for us and, you know, our food. And also, for having five places or whatever, it's hard to maintain and get that kind of award. You know, they only handed out five uh, Michelin in Colorado, and we received two of them. And then the a third one is a restaurant that I concepted and designed in Rhino as well. So we took over 50% of the market share of these awards in Colorado. Um, would be a huge deal if I were in Paris right now. I would be the, like me speaking here today, you know, everyone would be like, can I get your autograph? And it'd be a huge deal because Colorado just doesn't know, you know, we don't know yet how important or big the Michelin can be, um, but it's, uh, it'll catch on in a couple of years. Then people will look back and say, oh, wow, 
that was amazing. I got like all these recognitions. <laughs> but today it's like, that's where we're at. So uh, my food personally, I think about like, I like, I'm, I came to Colorado and I know we're landlocked, but I still spend a lot of time cooking near the water because I, I tend to like go towards uh, fish or grain. Uh, like, so grain meaning pasta, bread, things like that. These are the things that if, if I have to choose to eat, I'm going to a sushi counter in Japan in Tokyo, or I'm going to Italiano, like give me a bowl of pasta or, and it's what I like to eat is what I like to cook. So that's really what's driven me. All these different restaurants that I'm talking about, there's not a huge business plan behind it. This is like, you know, as we have grown our group and I actually, you know, for Basta, we didn't open anything for like eight years after opening and I worked every single day. Like I didn't take a day off. Like it was, there's a lot of stories, all those stories of Italy and cooking for over a year and a half, I worked for free, zero money. I did it for like room and board. But I also, you know, and just speaking about career path, since you are students, um, you know, like there's a couple ways to approach this industry if you do get into it. You know, one is, uh, you know, go and find the best chefs and go work for those chefs. Because, you know, if you go to a culinary school, you, oftentimes you're gonna pay a huge bill and you're gonna come out and someone's gonna offer you a $15 an hour position and it's not gonna, it doesn't pay the school bills. Like it, there's, it's, there's a few schools that are an exception. Or if you go to CIA in New York or whatever, those schools, there's some opportunities there to get the return on that value. But a lot of other culinary schools, two, four year programs, they're hard to get you know, your return on those unless you go off on your own like I did as an independent person and you start to make money eventually and all of that. Um, so that being said, I really encourage if you love this industry, do those kinds of things that I was talking about earlier. Find organizations and groups that pay you to be there instead of you paying them to learn the school set, you know, the set of hospitality or food, or I want to run Bell Resorts or I, whatever, anything that touches this industry, it's really uh, easy to go out and get a paycheck somewhere working for those companies. I started as a dishwasher. I got up to where I'm at today and did not go to culinary school. Um, but on the other side of that, I saw a lot of chefs going out of business when they went to open their restaurants. And that's why I focused on the business side. Good night, Mitch. Perfect. Um, so, you know, for, from that angle, um, you know, I really encourage that. So like, this is a student that's like, I'm interested in this hospitality thing, I, whatever. I think the sort of business angle, again, while you're working for great people, Go, going to school, going to college, going to those things, getting in those programs. Cornell, CSU have amazing hospitality programs that, you know, when you get a bachelor's degree from a school like that, that'll carry weight wherever you want to go. Like you can, you can get high up, high paying jobs out of school that really start to make sense for this industry. Um, but it isn't, you know, 10, 12 years ago, I wouldn't recommend this for everyone, really no one. I wouldn't tell my daughter or my son like, hey, you should, take over the family business, but so much again has changed for the positive and the good in hospitality over the last 12 years that I think it could be like a really lasting career. If you like those things like travel, food, uh, get out, whatever, this is, a, this is a profession that can wrap those types of passions into like a long uh, career if you do it right. That's all I got, that was all spitballing. I didn't rehearse that at all. That was beautiful. I hope it made sense. Let's give a quick round of applause. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, questions, if that's cool? I love it. Can I start with the first one? Yeah, please. What's the worst thing you ever dropped? Dropped? Like in the kitchen? Boom, to the floor. Uh, yeah, this is, there's not even a second place. I went to a Michelin three-star restaurant in Northern California. I consider this to be the greatest restaurant in the world, and they have like they they have this ceramic that you pour the so, like the soup on table side it's from Iga province in japan which i've been and it's not even from Iga province you have to hike over like four mountains to get to this one ceramicist that makes this one thing and if you go to their website it shows that's the picture of the what's on the website and i went back to the dish pit 
and they use these weird rubber mats in the kitchen that I wasn't used to. And this is my first day and I'm doing a stodge. A stodge is like, I'm just there for three, four days to like figure stuff out. I set it down. I went to introduce myself to the dishwasher and I heard it cracking six pieces. And then I had to work there four or five days after. And so every pre-service, which is how you talk before you go into service, pre-service, but like uh, they just said, and the guy glued it together. And he said every day, like, he's like, so you know, and I just had to like sit there and everyone in the whole place knew that I broke it. And then I was just there as like a free person. What It was terrible. It was, uh, it haunts that's me. That's Still today. Free, free. <laughs> <laughs> trauma, trauma, trauma. We've all got these like, yeah, the chef's got the I, I broke it story. Yeah. That's a good one. Yeah. Um, it's irreplaceable. You know I, what I mean? I was like, unless I. Uh, yeah. It's probably still there, still glued together. Yeah, it's still there, still glued together. You guys, how about some questions for ye old chef here? What do you got? So, I mean, you have questions. Questions. Kids, we've got some questions here. I, I'm good. I know that whole story. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, it was mentioned that you had five restaurants. Mm -hmm. How do you manage with all five of them? It seems like a lot to have to balance. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, first on a personal level, like I worked for a lot of chefs that you weren't called a chef unless you were chefing every night. So that's how I felt. So I did that forever. Uh, but uh, right now that I'm sort of running the company and I'm the chef, and I don't want to run the company forever. I want to be on the creative side. I'd like to be on the culinary side. But uh, the, the way that I manage currently, my leadership style is to empower people and put teams in place that basically my goal every day is to have nothing to do. That's how I tried to, and a lot of that had to do with COVID because there was so much happening. There was so much chaos. I couldn't control anything. So I had to let go of a lot of stuff that I tried to hold on to. As a chef, we like our ingredients lined up perfectly. We like to control the kitchen. We like to control the environment, everything around us. We're control freaks. And so like, you know, it's, so I started COVID really, and I had to start letting stuff go and trusting people and letting them lead. And like I said, on any given day, I, you know, when I, when, I, when I set the systems in place that, you know, now and the kitchens and everything, when I organize like that and I put all the little teams in place or whatever, now it gives me time. So my workflow looks like just going around to each team. I work on the menus with them. Sometimes I'll, I'll cook dishes, but it's less me cooking on the line. Uh, and you know, it's more of a, I go around and empower, high five, lead in a way that's like, you know, that versus trying to like micromanage and control every team is impossible. So I, this is, I'm right in the middle of trying to answer this question because it's tough. Like it's really not an easy thing. Um, and a lot of companies now just want to grow. Like mine, look, we just got the largest share of Michelin Awards in Colorado. So I could open 20 restaurants right now if we wanted to. And I just know that that could spin us out. That could, I don't know how to manage that. Uh, other than just, you know, I, my life turns to chaos and I still like to travel and I still like to snowboard and I still like to, you know, so I'm, I'm kind of trying to figure that out. But mostly it's my whole, business now has just turned into people business. Just hiring the best people. I'm hiring, I just hired a celebrity chef, Byron Gomez, he was on Top Chef a few seasons ago. He's super like famous, he's more famous in a sense that I have more restaurants and more Michelin stars than he does, but he's TV. And this is something I haven't tried before because I'm usually the face of the kitchen, but now I'm like trying to be like, oh, this guy is like, super celebrity influential why not hire him and let him take some of this off my plate uh, so it's all about people that's all so I can say thank you for a really great answer yeah. um, really great to have you it's, uh, thank you kind of cool to see another a chef who's got chef history it's really yeah cool. um, we're pretty much out of time you guys so um, thank you all for coming up with some questions you can ask me those questions tomorrow. I'll make up clever answers as if I was the chef. Okay. Um, you have the toke on, chef. Dude, I got the toke. Um, it's not even sweaty. <laughs> Round of applause. Here we go. Come on. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, of course.